We're the birthplace of the nation. We have the Liberty Bell, the Declaration of Independence. Philadelphians will identify that as part of their identity, but will also very much identify being a sports fan or being part of a sports culture as being part of their identity. Football drives the city. It drives talk radio. There's no bias against Reed that there wasn't against Roth, there wasn't against uh, Vermeer. When the Eagles play, uh, nothing else matters in this town. We play concerts at the Academy and now at the Kimmel Center on Sunday afternoons when the Eagles are playing. And I know that we have people there who are Eagles fans. And I'm flattered that they are coming to the concert but they do want to know the score. There's one gentleman who has been a subscriber for years. I don't know him by name, but I know him by sight. He always sits down in the second row, and for years, he would have an earpiece in his ear during the concert and listening to the game. Football was a perfect game for this city. It's a blue-collar game. It's a game where you get dirty and you hit people. We are rewarded for your work ethic. You're rewarded for playing hard all the time. This city is wired for football because this city loves that game. Philadelphia fans love football in a really dark and disturbing way. The national perception of the Philadelphia sports fan is that they are lunatics, almost pathologically negative. And I think it is a richly justified reputation. Hostile crowd! To me, the Philadelphia fans are the most hostile. Woo, the hostile are better. But, you know, for the most part, they haven't rioted, have they? They are meaner than anyone I've ever seen. They're very confrontational, and they are a special, special breed. They could use a good dose of class, because they don't show it all the time. PA people, they got away with words. <laughs> That's the way Texas Stadium should be, just like that. Just nasty. I would have that hug and chuck, they throwing water on me. Stop, right in that corner. Their fans get real aggro up there, man. get him. Philadelphia fans, you're, they're so unpredictable. You don't know what you're going to get from one game to the next, you know, from, from Boone Santa Claus to, I remember when Michael Irvin got hurt, you know, the, the cheering when, uh, when he went down, basically a career-ending injury. They cheer. What? They cheer. It's an expect none less. Martin Gramatic, our kicker, got run over by the camera. The truck ran over his, his left foot when he's over there practicing kicking but right before he's going out. Next thing you know, I hear the fans cheer and I look back and what happened? Oh, Martin got run over. <laughs> and I said, and they're cheering. And uh, they said, hey, it's Philly. And it's supposed to be the city of brotherly love. Um, but we don't show love all the time. That's why they call the city the brotherly love. They have no love for no brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I almost get the sense from the Philly fans that they thrive on creating that identity as the worst sports fans on the planet. It seems like they kind of get off on it. It's like somebody being the toughest guy in a bar, and they'll just pick fights every once in a while and prove that they're the toughest guy. It was a place that I, I grew to really like in, in a kind of a distorted, perverted way. I tell you, Lawrence, they call this the city of brotherly love, but it's really a banana republic, communist country. I was verbally abused a great deal there. But the more they did it to you as you went there on a yearly basis, the more you began to understand that it was part of a, a respect that they had. I think they're the best sports fans in America. Any sport, any city. These people really know the game. They understand the nuances of football. They understand when a guy's letting them down. They can see a guy that's afraid to catch a ball over the middle and not take that hit. They are a city of passion. Should we reward apathy over passion? Not in sports. The passion is always consistent, win, lose, or draw. But if this team doesn't live up to the expectations, I, gonna, I think you're going to see the other side of the coin, which is that passion is going to start to come out with, you're disappointing us too? You're letting us down also? In Philadelphia, that always comes out in one famous sound. A true Philadelphia fan learns to boo before he learns to speak. I've always said that they, they kind of think like football coaches think. There's no one harder on themselves when things don't go right than a coach and a player. And they're right there with you. They're going to boo you when things aren't going the right way. With the uh, second pick, 
the Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb, quarterback, Syracuse University. Whether it's booing the selection of Donovan McNabb on draft day or booing the only quarterback to take the Eagles to a Super Bowl, Philly fans put even their best players to the test. I didn't like to be booed. No one likes to be booed. We all like to be liked. But clearly, there were probably days where I didn't play up to my ability, and they were letting me have it. Richard was there. Those experiences, although they, they, they hurt at the time, they built my character. And uh, if you can survive those negative fans, you can certainly be better for it. I've talked to so many players in football and other sports who love it here because you get that immediate feedback. we got great fans. They helped us pull this one out today. And I've, talked, I've spoken to a lot of players here that can't wait to get out of town because you get such immediate feedback. <laughs> what I find interesting, though, is how young fans, and I have three young kids myself, sort of learn how to be a Philadelphia fan. Our young kids get immersed in this culture of passion sometimes comes out in booing, and I think it increases the chances when they're sitting in the 700 level and something doesn't go their way, they're going to boo. Why? Because that's what they saw their father do, and that's what they saw their grandfather do. If they get some booing going on, well, then usually they deserve it, and even the players recognize that, you know. They, they know when they're not performing, you're going to hear about it. Why don't you, as dad, to impress the little boy? He'll never forget this, Mike. I see people come up to our tent before a game and actually have three- and four-year-old children who know four or five or six words, and two of those words taught by dad are Dallas socks. <laughs> I've seen it, it's amazing. Because why? Because Dallas socks! Dallas socks! Dallas socks! Dallas socks! Dallas, we hate you! <laughs> Dallas, right here, at the vet! For some Philadelphia fans, just beating an opponent isn't nearly as satisfying as beating him senseless. They may score 30 or 40 points, you know, in, in one game. Um, but, but the city is much happier if they knocked out two or three people. You stop somebody in South Philly and ask them about the body bag game, and they'll tell you exactly how many guys were carted off that field that night against the Washington Redskins. The body bag game! Oh, the body bag, baby! You know what? I'm going to tell you, Buddy Ryan, Salute, man. Buddy Ryan made the, the comment that, you know, they're going to be carting us off in body bags, and they actually hurt nine people. They know the players that were carted off. They know that Brian Mitchell came in and the running back to finish the game as a quarterback. Our boy Brian Mitchell had to come in and be the quarterback. You know, like Brian Mitchell. <laughs> they're proud of that. He's hit. Bubble. He fumbles. Now, if you ask them who scored three touchdowns in a game, they don't always seem to remember who scored touchdowns. Touchdown! But, man. They, they have a keen interest in when somebody gets knocked out. This is, after all, a city where Rocky Balboa is the patron saint. Rocky captured the personality of many Philadelphians, the self-image of many Philadelphians. We like to think of ourselves as the underdog that always perseveres. I don't think Rocky would have been the same character if he had been in San Diego or Los Angeles. Somebody once described Philadelphia as a left-hook town. Rocky was the personification of Philadelphia, a guy in a tough, demanding job who has his shot at fame and isn't going to take any shortcuts to get there. That's what they like here. They don't like, you know, little uh, uh, three o'clock teas and little finger sandwiches. They like cheesesteaks, pretzels, stuff that stick to your ribs. They want to be a real kind of a down and dirty city. They like ditch diggers. They don't like ballet dancers. Uh, they want their athletes to have mud and blood and some tears and some sweat and mostly they don't care if they get knocked down. They care that they get back up. Rocky he was just a blue collar boxer and he worked hard and, and, and he came from nowhere to, to become a champion and, and I think Rocky caught the spirit of the of the city to bottle. Back goes McNabb. We want the same all-out effort, the same sort of blue-collar, working-class mentality on the field that we have as a city. And trying to get in, and he is for a touchdown. He pushed, he shoved, he pushed, he shoved. He just wouldn't be denied. But we've had a lot of real, not fictional Rockies, we've had a lot of real Rockies play on that field and event over the last 32, 34 years.
The vet is one of these abominations of modern sports where somebody got the great idea to try to maximize uh, profits by combining football and baseball, which are two totally different sports and, and, and need to be played in completely different venues in, in the same venue. So you draw a big circle, lay down some concrete in the middle of it, spread some plastic turf over top of it, and cram 80,000 people in. It's nasty, it's filthy, it's hard, it's seamy. You got some metal spots over here. Um, you got some dirt showing over here. You got some concrete over here. You got some patches from Home Depot over here. It's, um, it's horrendous. It is a huge relief that it's being replaced. Remember last year there was a controversy of Vieques Island near Puerto Rico whether the Navy should use it as a bombing range. And I felt the Navy should use Veterans Stadium as a bombing range. The, the problem was that the, the, the playing surface is so hard that the bombs would have just bounced off. It's a parking lot, man. Like what? playing out in the parking lot. No, this, this, should be, this right here should be outlawed. Oh. Yeah, you can take a pole in the leg. It gets slick over here. I don't think there's anything else about Veterans Stadium you would remember other than the fact that people got hurt on it and games were canceled because of it. The field was so bad, the Eagles and Ravens refused to play the 2001 preseason opener. Watch that turn. Look at that seam right there. It was unbelievable when you walked on that field and literally your foot would sink into the ground a good three or four inches. Look at that. that I, I, I can't get to the bottom of that one. Oh, we're, going to put, we're going to put our team on this, huh? The game has been officially canceled because of uh, turf that was unplayable. It was just another chapter in an amazing book of Veteran Stadium. Isn't this the great place for this to happen? Oh, where else? Where else? Visiting teams have complained about the vet turf since the first game ever played there in 1971. Marlon's hollering about that end. Huh? Marlon hollering about how bad that end is down there. You know, he said if you was running up and you hit that and was looking for the ball, you'd fall down. Yeah, I'm sure would. Nowhere else would I ever go up to the line of scrimmage. And my first thought was, let me turn around and look and make sure I wasn't going to trip over a seam when I'm dropping, dropping back. And it's the truth. I did it almost every play. I look and I go, oh, let me make sure second base is not back there at the big seam, so I go falling over. If they were worried about when they're running a pass route where that seam was at the pitcher's mound, they're not concentrating on running that pass route. So it was a home field advantage. People will say, ooh, we hate coming there. You know, your, your turf stinks, your stadium stinks, your city stinks. And basically, as an eagle, I love it. The bottom line is that place is a hole, and we like it like that. <laughs> the the new stadium, if you look at it, it's awesome, beautiful. The vet we is like the it best. like a hole. The vet's got the vet... personality. Exactly. Personality in the vet. Hard we got it all with the vet. <laughs> Crazy Woo! fans. We love it. We're going to miss it. Attending a game at the vet made sailing and steerage seem luxurious. There aren't enough toilets, uh, there's not enough place to, places to get something to eat, and working there is like working in a, in a very old maximum security prison, in the sense that it's all damp and cold and, and concrete, leaking pipes. People get dogs to like, you know, keep cats away, or dogs would be like guard dogs. We had our guard cats. Cats are everywhere. Finally, I found a security guy and I said, what is with all these cats? He says, you want cats or rats? The cats eat the rats. So I learned to like the cats after a while. I seen one cat grow. You know, I remember when he was a kitten and he grew. <laughs> it might have been the same cat. During training camp, came through, fell, fell through the roof, and uh, destroyed all Juan Castillo, our offensive line coach. Destroyed all of his playbooks, peed everywhere. And uh, to this day, that office still smells like that cat. The vet may have been overrun by cats and rats, but it was really a place for the birds. The team adapted its personality and its play to that stadium too, and man, that meant war. It wasn't a football game. It was about fighting. It was about survival. All I used to give myself a pep talk during the week. You're gonna have to be tough. This fight, Jim, just, just, let's just let it go, because that's what it was. Spending a Sunday at the vet was tough on visiting players, but it could be just as tough on visiting fans. You get somebody from another city who attempts to walk through the 700 section. Those are the maniacal fans in the upper reaches of Veterans Stadium. Uh, they are doing so at their own risk. These guys are crazy, man. They want to fight all the time. Well, I love it. Guys love it.
love that. They love to be in that section where they're throwing guys out and beating them up and <laughs> the strong should survive. Some of these guys are fathers. The parents and their kids are going to grow up to be just like them. So we will have a similar level forever. One of the smartest things that they did was, and I think it's no surprise that it was a Philadelphia innovation, is to set up the actual municipal court in the stadium so that if they grab you for doing something idiotic, you will be in jail that day. The first fan brought in front of Judge McCafferty was completely drunk, and Judge McCafferty was reading in the charges uh, that were filed by the police against the, against the fan, and he turns to the fan and he says, do you understand what I've just told you, what the charges are against you? And the fan was trying to say, yes, Your Honor, but he threw up all over the little temporary bench that had been created for the judge. And I said, this is a great start to our, to our, to our court. You tell me where, where else do you have this kind of bad behavior where you have a judge in the bowels of the stadium? That's his job, to be there every week, Sundays, on a holy day, to be there putting people in jail. We got a judge there, and he's become famous. It wasn't so much a matter of missing the game. Every time our fans do something tough and rough and are, are, are bad to even our own, for every one of those incidences, there are 50 incidences where our fans, by the power and fervor they bring to a stadium, can lift the team. I've sat in, in the vet countless number of times, and I've seen the Eagle defense presented with totally intolerable situations. Here's your ball game. Eagles could win it if they stop the Cowboys here. And then the fans start to go crazy, and it builds like a crescendo. And you can almost see the Eagles players' shoulders get higher and their heads raised, and, and you can almost see the fans' energy literally running through their bodies. Here we go, fourth down. They give it to Smith, and they stop them again! They stop them again! Standing on the field, late in games at the vet, I have felt like I've felt at very few other places. Listen to the crowd, they are roaring. You feel like this is not safe to stand here right now. The earth is moving. The fans make it a seismic event. It wasn't warm or plush, but for 32 years, the vet held the heartbeat of the Eagles and their fans. It'll be a tearful thing for me. I, I think Douglas MacArthur, when he resigned, he, he said, old soldiers never die. Uh, they just fade away. And I, I think that's how I remember the vet. The memories aren't going to diminish. They're going to get brighter in, in the sunset. I'll never forget Randall. I can close my eyes now and see Randall make some of those incredible plays and those incredible leaps. And those are the memories I'll have of the vet. And that was 30 some odd years of our lives as fans. And you know, if you're a true fan, you're gonna miss those memories. 65,000 screaming fans. That's the snapshot that I have. You know, it was our field. It was our house. It was our home. In March of 2004, Veterans Stadium was a lonely, hollowed-out shell. For five months, the city engineers had taken the old ballpark apart. All that remained was the final implosion on March 21st. In its final days, some old friends stopped by to reminisce. Veterans Stadium might be just imploded, but nobody's going to take away the heart and the spirit of the vet. People forget that this stadium had a soul and a heart that it breathed with people. Everybody in South Philly worked here, you know, and, uh, you know, it was Philly to the ninth power. It was the Liberty Bell, it was, it was City Hall, it was South Philly, it was Rocky. This stadium is Rocky. Look at the punch right there. That's what this stadium is. Seeing the vet in its final days and recalling how it deteriorated in its later years, it was easy to forget that when it opened in 1971, it was considered a state-of-the-art facility that dazzled fans and visitors alike. What do you think of these facilities, Bill? Boy, really great. About the best, I guess, I've ever seen. Also, this is a great seat because I'm high enough and my angle's very good. It's on the oblique. And I think I prefer this seat to being on the 50, taking the pure, the straight horizontal view. 
you the stadium is absolutely magnificent. You don't think you're too far away here? No, I don't think so. In fact, I think you're probably closer here than you are in most of these double-purpose stadiums, the baseball-football compromise. Well, it ought to be a good stadium. It cost enough. The vet cost $52 million to build in 1971. Jim Murray was the Eagles' publicist that year, and it was his job to promote the first preseason game in the new stadium. The guy who hired me, Pete Retzlaff, gave me implicit orders that this stadium was to be filled. And thank God we're in South Philly, because every kid in South Philly snuck into the stadium. It was like Spider-Man. I remember pulling them up the walls. Thank God they didn't fall. But we had about 70,000 people here, and even though it wasn't 70,000 paid, it was over a sellout for the first game. The Vets' grand opening was also the first Philadelphia appearance of the Buffalo Bills and O.J. Simpson. Hey, we open the stadium for them, man. All right, let's open it some more. Hey, let's, open this. let's open it a little wider. A little wider. A little wider. <laughs> let's give them a big score on opening day for the fans. Hey, let's... The game also marked the Philadelphia debut of a six-foot-eight rookie receiver, a seventh-round draft pick named Harold Carmichael. Oh. Hey, 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 J.A., hey, Butch, what's his name? That big rookie. Carmichael. Carmichael. Six, seven, two, three, five. Where Six, he come seven, from, two, three, man? Southern. What was he tough. What was he draft to Big damn dude. Seven. seven. He tough. All they got him cheap. All them computers. They got him cheap. <laughs> All them computers. Yeah, them computers. And he's a seven-round draft to it. <laughs> Ain't that a trip? Oh, boy, tough. <laughs> God. Harold Carmichael went on to play 13 seasons with the Eagles. He played 96 regular season and postseason games at Veterans Stadium, more than any other player. His streak of 162 consecutive games is the longest in Eagles history, and he set team records for pass receptions, receiving yards, and touchdowns. He joined the Eagles' front office in 1998 as Director of Player Relations, so he was still there when the vet was shut down. I turned around, looked at this place, and just to see it the way it is now, it kind of, you know, it's getting, I mean, you know, I'm getting kind of emotional about this thing now. In a way, you can say I grew up here. I spent more time in Philadelphia than I did in the place I was born. And um, this is now home for me. Uh, people that, uh, that grew with me, people that really helped me to really um, hone my skills. You look at the end zone, you look down the sideline when you're doing the fade patterns. You're just looking back there and you can hear some of the sounds. You, uh, there's times you can, you can kind of see things that happen in, in that stadium. It's gonna be very odd to drive by here and not see it. Because I'd always drive by here and tell people that's my office. You know, when my kids were born and we drove by here, I say that that was my office. And there's a lot of memories that come back. It's just really the laughs in the locker room and the camaraderie and the goofing on one another. And everything else. I mean, Veterans Stadium was our home. I mean, it wasn't pretty, and uh, it's going to be sad to see it go. The most vivid memory will always be the bitter cold day in 1981 when the Eagles met Dallas for the NFC Championship. I don't think that, that this stadium's ever been that high. This stadium was on fire. I don't care how cold it was, everybody had a warm heart. And you see that great shot of you guys have of Tom Landry coming out with like the Russian hat. And there was no way, Vermeil had our, our team if he was a horse trainer, he'd have won the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. We were not going to lose that game. I remember the pregame when we had the giant flag from Cardinal Doherty High School, and we had Andre McCardle singing. My home, sweet I guess her big hit was Tomorrow, Tomorrow. That's what Veterans Stadium did for those fans. Tomorrow we're going to get them. Tomorrow we're going to win that game. I remember a guy who was a combat veteran from Vietnam. The game hadn't even started yet, and he said that was the most emotional moment of his life. Everybody knew we were going to win that game, but you still had to have Wilbur run into the end zone. You still had to have Merle make that call. Jaworski gives off inside. Running over. When that happened, those tears and cheers are still happening right now. 
people, you could still hear them across the street. You know, that was our moment, and that's the moment of the vet. We, we never brought it a Super Bowl victory, but we brought it to the Super Bowl. And I just remember trying to get off the field and how difficult it was, you know, with everybody pounding on you and just smelling the breath of the fans. It was like walking through a distillery. I remember very well uh, running, to, going in the locker room, everybody's getting undressed, and I look up and I see my wife running in the locker room. I am saying, get out of here, people are getting undressed here. <laughs> but everybody, this whole fan base was on fire. It was a very, very great time for us. In March 2004, those images were gone. It was just a matter of counting down the last few hours until the implosion. A couple of times after listening and hearing people saying that they're going to do this on Sunday morning, I kind of got butterflies. And it started kind of, kind of hitting me. I said, this is my first home. And, you know, it's tough to uh, see somebody come and tear down your first home. Where I grew, where my talent was developed here, uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears are in that place. And I don't care how deep you dig the hole, you cannot get rid of the blood, sweat, and tears that I've had in that place. I feel nostalgic. I feel nostalgic for what this stadium meant to the city and what, to, what it meant to me personally in, in my lifetime. And at a point in my life as a young man where uh, life could not get much better. And I think the whole journey of life for some people came from the vet. They grew up here. People got engaged here. People got married here. People cried here. Veteran Stadium is not a building for me, it's people. You know, who could just say 700 level and, and know what you mean? The 700 level, those people have more passion than Mel Gibson. You know, they're there and they, they care so much about this team that their ghosts are up there forever. In 33 years, Philadelphia's Veteran Stadium was home to three World Series, two NFC Championship games, and one very passionate fan base. But the vet was wrapped in an eerie silence in its final days. 3,000 pounds of explosives were brought into the stadium, and workmen carefully assembled the individual charges. They placed the explosives in the concrete support beams, and connected them with four miles of detonation wire. The implosion was a delicate process because the vet was less than 300 feet from a neighborhood of row houses. So the stadium had to come down with as little vibration as possible. As dawn broke on Sunday, March 21st, thousands of people crowded the streets of South Philadelphia to watch the vet pass into memory. It's going to be a sad day. It's a, a place that, you know, those of us that work there grew to love and love the place and love the people. So it's going to be a little bit sad. And like I said to him this morning, if there had never been a vet, we never would have met. Yeah, right. We're, <laughs> just from working here at the park, and, and we're not unique in that regard. There's lots and lots of people that, that I met their spouses the, yeah. here. She I works work for the, the Phillies, and I, and I work the as city. A, for the city. So. It's, uh, it'll be special always because of that. The last day in the building uh, for us was January 12th, and I did try to kind of walk around and just kind of reflect on a lot of the memories and a lot of the excitement and a lot of the neat things that happened there. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a, a weird day. He even had tears in his eyes. He came home really upset that day. He really did. Just say that. Oh, you're allowed to have tears in your eyes, honey. Did you feel that though? Yeah, I did. I really did. And like I said, a lot of it revolves around the people that were there too. You know, I met a lot of wonderful people and, and developed a lot of relationships that I hope will carry on in the future. We'll sure remember it for very fond memories of bringing families to the, to the park, uh, of uh, it being part of the community. You know, teams that really belong to the community. The Eagles belong to the community, the Phillies belong to the community, and what you have here is an outpouring of the community coming out in the morning. I, you know, the last week I've heard everybody on the radio saying, you know, it's a dump, and it was our dump, and I guess I never really thought of it as a dump, and maybe yeah. because I've grown up in Philly and it's the only real stadium that I've ever really known, so, I mean, I just think of it as the vet, and it's just a lot of fun times there, so, a lot of disappointment, but I prefer to think of the fun times instead. <laughs> It 
was home. It was home. I loved it. I didn't want to see it go. I didn't want to see it go. And the, all these other cardboard stadiums. And the end of an this era. is home. There's no, it's never going to be another vet. It's never going to be another stadium like know, the vet. In about the fans made it. It had, it had an edge. It was, it was unique. Will and there'll never be another one like it. The NFC Championship game in '81. Now, that's the topper. That place was never so loud. I think this place had a lot of good memories, not only for fans, but for me. I spent a lot of time here, thousands of hours, saw an awful lot of ball games here. Obviously, this place had some flaws. Uh, to me, I don't think they're as major as a lot of people made them out to be. Um, so I do think it was maligned somewhat, and uh, that's kind of unfortunate because it wasn't that bad a place, at least in my mind. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to lose a, a good friend in a way. And uh, this feels a little bit like going to a funeral. In the weeks leading up to the implosion, the inside of the stadium was gutted. The field was torn up, the lower seating area was ripped out, and the concrete ramps were demolished. By March 21st, the vet was little more than a concrete skeleton. In the early morning cold, the fans gathered to see Mayor John Street count down the final seconds. The Philly fanatic and former Philly star Greg Lazinski set off the blast. Two thousand eight hundred individual explosions brought down the one hundred three concrete columns, section by section, memory by memory. Thirty three years of sports history were gone in sixty two seconds. The vet was reduced to 700 tons of rubble and dust. Soon it would be cleared, and by September, the old playing field would be a parking lot for the two new stadiums. But this day was a time for reflection. Sadness, a lot of memories went real quick. A shame to see it go. I mean, I've got 17 years sitting in there for season tickets with the Eagles, and, uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of memories missed. Was it more emotional than you thought it was going to be? Yeah, I mean, I, I, looking over there right now, seeing that pile of rubble, it's, it's just a shame. I, I mean, I love that place. You know, I mean, I, you know, we have the link now, we have New Citizens Bank, but uh, the vets always want to hold a special place in my heart. You know, actually, it, it hit me about one minute before when they announced the one-minute mark, and um, a flood of memories just... Came, came through and I got a little emotional at that point in time. Uh, I was with the Eagles for 16 years in that building and um, a lot of good memories, a lot of good friends um, that I met there. But after I got here, I realized that it's a place that I wanted to be, that I wouldn't have wanted to miss this. So it's mixed emotions kind of thing. Absolutely, yes. This is a ticket when they dedicated the stadium back in 1971. Uh, my father was a uh, member of the color guard that marched on the field uh, the day they dedicated it. And it was, um, it was a great day. It was sunny. The turf was green like you never saw green before. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a beautiful stadium, brand new, state of the art. And we thought it was going to be here for a lot longer than 30 years. <laughs> and now it's gone. I think back and I look at that rubble over there and I feel like all those memories are in a big pile, <laughs> right there, in a big pile of dust. And I can always look back, tell my kids, my grandkids, you know, I was there when they dedicated it, and I was there when they tore it down. I definitely missed the vet because, uh, you know, he had a lot of great players come through there. You know, the, the Philadelphia defense, all that history, man, and knowing that, that you, you've walked the same path that some of those guys have walked, man, that's, you know, that's amazing. 
I do get sad about it. I mean, uh, 10 years of Veteran Stadium and uh, some very memorable moments down there. The 99-yard touchdown pass to Mike Quick uh, in overtime to beat the Atlanta Falcons. You know, it's a record that can only be tied, never broken. I think it was the longest touchdown pass ever because the ball is like one inch from the goal line. <laughs> so I think it was like 99 yards, two feet and 11 inches. Fires the football, complete the quick. He's going to go. Anyone that's been an Eagles fan over the last 30 years who has an element of history and nostalgia is going to be sad to a certain degree because there have been some great moments in there. There have been a lot of moments in there, a lot of great players on the Eagles visiting teams. Uh, and all those moments, at some level, are going to be destroyed when he destroyed the stadium. And I think that's sadness. I, I feel sadness about that. One of the reasons I love Philadelphia, I live in Philadelphia, is such a diversity in terms of ethnicity, in terms of race, in terms of age. And you go to an Eagles game and you really see that represented in the fans. And as a youngster and as an adult and as a parent, I've appreciated that sense of community, that sense of team, that sense of mob sometimes, and that sense of diversity that um, is really expressed when you go to an Eagles game. And it's a very strong feeling. You build relationship with the guys you went to the Eagles games with. The new bishop, uh, Father Burbridge, he's the new bishop of Philadelphia. The thing I hear about him the most is how him and his dad sat in the same section for years at the vet. And You know, uh, once again, I think it's a religious experience to have not just a good neighborhood, a Philly neighborhood, but where you sat at the vet. This reminds me of what we just went through with the Philly Pops. We were at the Academy of Music, which is 125 years old. We were there for 23 years straight. And we moved to the new Kimmel Center. We were very happy at the Kimmel Center, Bryson Hall. But it was really tough to leave the Academy because we had been there so long. And with all its flaws and so forth, it still was home. And I think it's tough to leave home. We're going to win every game we play at home. That's going to make good teams. You win one, you got your home crowd behind you. We're going to take advantage of it. We're going to crack some heads today, baby. For me, it was a home for seven years. You know, I lived in that place. It was my bedroom. It was my kitchen. It was my dining room. It was my workplace, you know. And uh, I had so many great experiences in that stadium. And they weren't all winning, but they were great experiences. And, and shared so many great relationships within that stadium. There were some things I didn't like about the stadium. I didn't like the turf. Uh, I, you know, we were way behind times in weight room size and all that kind of stuff. But uh, to me, there's still an emotional attachment to everything that took place within that stadium, you know. And it really centers around the people. Veteran Stadium was a good place where good things happened. And the moments I'll remember are maybe quiet times. You know, maybe saying a little prayer after the game that everybody gets home safely or walking around before the game seeing maybe a sick child that we brought into the locker room, seeing those players give that child a hug. Uh, my memories of the vet are, are, are sacred to me and uh, they once again don't diminish. They're, uh, they're something that's part of who I am. I'll remember the 700 level and then the image it took on. The fans remained hearty and, and caring uh, in spite of the conditions and in spite of the lack of great success on this on the part of this team. They, they haven't won a lot of championships. <laughs> and uh, the fans endure. And, and I guess that's, that's what I remember best. Uh, I remember the fans and, and, and what the 700 level came to be. This is Mel Reese live here at Veterans Stadium. The Eagles have just defeated the Dallas Cowboys to go 2-1 of this 2002 football season. One of the very first NFL games I ever saw uh, was at Veterans Stadium. Uh, at the time, I, I was uh, in junior high school. My dad got, got us tickets and uh, went to the game. Um, I might as well have been in the Taj Mahal. I mean, the, the vet was as beautiful to me as anything I could ever see. And 
and, and the excitement of it all was something I'll never forget. And my dad passed away recently, and, and when I started reminiscing about the vet, that comes to mind. When you see all that happen, when you see it all kind of go away, your childhood memories uh, disappear with that, but it's something I always keep in my heart. I think the first thing I thought, thought about uh, when it was going down was the NFC Championship game we won. And we went to the Super Bowl in that place. There was a pitch and there was a noise in there I've never heard before. Uh, and uh, it's all gone now, it's history. But the greatest thing about it is the one thing that, that I know that they can never take away from that stadium is that the Philadelphia Eagles went to the Super Bowl in that stadium. And no one can ever do that again. I'll miss the memories. Uh, as long as I live, I'll never forget uh, uh, Eagles, Cowboys in the year we went to the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, as cold as it could be, and you know, Wilbur Montgomery and, and, and that incredible run and us just blowing the Cowboys away. I'll never forget that. It was a bad place to play football, but even bad places to play football, um, you know, leave lasting memories and lasting impressions. To me, I'm, I'm sort of nostalgic about it. I think we're going to think differently about the vet as the years pass. I think it's, we're going to look back across the street and there's going to be a parking lot there and there's going to be, there's going to be great stories told. Uh, half of them, you know, lies, but there'll be some great stories told about Veteran Stadium. I can always remember coming out of the locker room and I could see the light out at the end of the tunnel and, and I tell you it just gave me goosebumps and the adrenaline started to flow. You know you could hear the crowd, you could hear the noise, kind of a, a dull roar because you're not quite out of the field that you're probably about, about 70, 80 yards from the field. As I watched my teammates go on the field I could see it, you know I could feel it, I could almost taste it going on the field. I mean it was a, it was a tremendous feeling, those concrete walls, that tunnel coming out and then when you came out it was like boy just coming out of that tunnel you see the fans, you hear the noise and you knew you were ready to play. This NFL Films production has been brought to you by the National Football League. The NFL is online at www.nfl.com.